Hello, I'm recording a quick video to go over um, this last section test, um, which is posted now to Moodle and uh, is due Friday, April 20th by 11.55. That's five minutes to midnight. Now, um, I usually give you a lot of time. I'm giving you more time uh, for this assignment. Um, it, that allows you to manage what's probably a busy schedule. Um, and then on top of that, please use this time. Um, break this questions, these questions down to their various parts and put some real effort into answering them. Um, I'm fully aware that uh, these can be complicated questions and that require a lot of thought and, and man, that's philosophy. That's philosophy. Um, so uh, with regard um, to, to what you're supposed to be doing on these questions, you're supposed to read the question, think carefully about it, go through the material that I've assigned, and think very carefully about what's involved in, um, in, in responding properly to these questions. Right? This is a way of checking whether or not you understand the, materi the, the material, you understand the problematics sort of introduced by the material, and uh, that you're capable of engaging with it. I ask you these kinds of questions not because I'm being a jerk, but because I think you can do it. Right? And um, if your grades are any indication, a number of you have rose to the challenge. Um, so, it, like usual, there's a bunch of uh, boilerplate here. Um, that's, that's, this is what section tests are. 20 possible points, 4 questions, 5 points each. It'll be 2 on Nietzsche, 2 on Sart for this one. Um, I'm looking for two paragraph responses minimally um, for these kinds of questions. Again, it's got to be a writing intensive course, so um, it, that's, that's what it's got to be. Um, we are engaging with uh, Nietzsche's Beyond Good and Evil, the preface, section one and section two. Um, and in fact, looking at my questions, uh, it, they're both from the preface in section number one. Right? So I give you a bit of an easier section there. Um, and then I asked you two very general questions about um, uh, Sartre's existentialism and human emotions. Um, the two and their related questions uh, go to the heart of like what you should basically know if you're claiming to know this book. Right? So, so um, I tried to be pretty straightforward with these. Um, um, yeah. Other things I should mention, if you've not done the forums yet, that's 10% of your final grade. Do the forums. They close at the same time as this test does. Uh, April 20th at 11.55 p.m. That's five minutes to midnight, so I'll be still giving credit um, for forum responses in the meantime. So uh, you have that amount of time um, on Friday the 13th, uh, lucky, I guess. Uh, you have your last quiz due, um, so uh, be sure to get on that uh, pertaining to the start material. Um, it, again, it was very easy on that quiz. Um, in, in fact, there's one question that's a dead giveaway, right? There's no wrong answer. So um, you should be in good shape for that. Um, uh, what I'm assuming uh, you've got, it's, if you're in the on-campus class, I'm assuming you've been to lecture and um, we've discussed this material. If you're in the online class, I assume that you've watched my videos on both Nietzsche and Sartre and all of the other supplementary videos. Uh, for Nietzsche, that's Nietzsche on Truth and Lie and the School of Life Nietzsche video. Uh, for Sartre, that's Rick Roderick, Sartre and the Roads to Freedom. Uh, School of Life Philosophy Sart and School of Life Philosophy Sart on Bad Faith, right? So um, that's your video material, and I assume you've read the book, right? Um, it, it, these are sort of minimums, right? And to a certain extent, what I'm looking for is engagement with this material. So, um, so short answer questions requiring a minimum of two paragraphs writing for your response. Um, with regard to that, I'm still getting some responses to these that um, do not meet that minimum. And again, if you don't give me two paragraphs, since I've stated a minimum, you've not satisfied the minimum requirements. So, uh, you know, no matter how brilliant your one paragraph plus one sentence is, it still doesn't satisfy the minimum requirements uh, for the question. So, um, cannot pass, that's the thing. So, um, it, it, when I say minimum, give me at least the minimum, right? 
Um, uh, by sentences, I mean full sentences. Um, it's in some responses, I've been getting point form outlines. Well, that's good to organize your thoughts. Uh, I can't give that credit because, well, it's not sentences. It's too vague. I have to interpret it in order to. So, um, five points each, total of 20, two on Nietzsche, two on Sartre. Um, the criteria that I use, like usual, um, to assess this, um, clarity of response, right? Um, can, can somebody reading this figure out what the heck you're saying, right? Completeness, did you engage with all of the relevant aspects that are important to the question? Uh, understanding of uh, exhibited um, in your use of the course material and or the strength of the argument or in the case where there's not an argument, which I think is most of the cases here, um, your insight into the material in question, right? So um, it, effectively those are, that's the matrix that I use to, I ask myself, well, is, is it a clear response or is there amb ambiguity? Um, clarity is the only place where grammar actually and spelling actually wind up um, affecting your grade, because if you use a word and I don't know what the word is, or you use the wrong word, it's not clear, right? Completeness, um, like I say, break down the question. If you're not sure what's going on with regard um, to to um, this material, then uh, you know you better get clear on that, right? Um, uh, understanding exhibited, um, basically it's, it's not enough that you stared at the page, you've got to actually have thought about and developed some sort of comprehension of what you're studying. And um, then finally, insight, right? Um, it, you know, this is, this is what turns a B into an A, effectively. Um, it's, it, I mean, if, if, if you've made a connection that's sort of intricate, intricate and subtle, this is, this is what turns an adequate response into an excellent response. And if you see the word excellent, um, that, that means I found something insightful. Or you've made a stout argument, right? And have, you know, it's impressive, so should be rewarded with an A-range grade. Um, it, today, uh, this week, um, it, it, I've got office hours on Wednesday from 4.30 till 6. Um, so uh, please feel free to stop by and ask me any questions about the questions that you may have. Um, I'm doing additional office hours. Um, and uh, do, 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 when shall I do that? How about Monday, Monday afternoon? Um, how about I come in uh, between um, two and four, right? So I will write that down so that I know what the heck is going on. Um, I'm going to be on campus in my office on Monday from two until 4 p.m. Four office hours. And um, it, you, know, you should be using these office hours. I've got a few, a very few, that are actually availing themselves to this. Um, if you're unclear, if you think my questions are too general or too vague, and you want me to break them down further, if you want to get a clear idea of what I'm asking, that's in these videos I try to give you just that. But if you're still murky on what I'm looking for, this is the, you know, this is the point where you become an adult student and come in and ask the questions you need to ask in order to 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 to, to succeed in this course so anyhow um, that's uh, that's um, the deal uh, the missed assignment policy um, it, here's the thing for a final I get your final test uh, the registrar office gives me 48 hours to turn that around into a grade so these ones you will have your grades quickly that means that I cannot offer succinct, substantial comments, right? Um, that also means that the missed assignment policy, I, it, if the sky falls, I am still in a position to offer you an, ex an extension, but it's got to be a very, very, very short extension because the Office of the Registrar needs these grades from me. If you need a few hours, like 12 hours or something like that, I can do that. 
But if you need five days, no, it, it, I've already given you a bunch of days with this material. So please plan your time. Please work ahead. Please have it done early. Right? Um, in, in general, I've given far too many extensions. Right? One out of five on each test have had an extension. Um, this is in addition to opening quizzes back up, and I give you two weeks with the material and the quiz. So um, it, we've got to keep this to a minimum. Right? Please only ask if the sky is actually falling. Right? If life is actually it, dumping it in your lap in some way. Um, it, make sure that I've got your as, uh, assignment submission. Make sure it's the right one. Make sure it's complete. Make sure it actually submitted. If you're worried about it, email me. Um, and plagiarism, um, I have had a few issues with plagiarism. Understand that there's a zero tolerance policy. And, it, you know, it's just not worth it. You remember from Mill cost-benefit analysis, uh, the cost of plagiarizing is just far too high, right? If, if, if I get a case of plagiarized work where, you know, substantial sections are taken from online sources word for word or something along those lines, uh, you don't just fail the assignment, you fail the course, and then on top of that, the really egregious cases, I'm required to pass them on to the Dean of Students' office as a case of academic misconduct. You, you, you could be kicked out of school, right? I don't want you in that position, I don't want me in that position, so just don't do it, we'll be fine. You're always better reflecting on this material and giving me what comes out of your own noggin anyway. Right, so um, four questions, let's go over them. Question one reads, Nietzsche had several points to uh, the sections of Beyond Good and Evil that we have looked at, refers to perspectivity, calling it in the preface, the fundamental condition of all life. Roderick, in the video posted to Moodle, defends this position, claiming that it's not a form of relativism. Right? That, that was the important thing, he called it. He called it a mislabeling of a, of a position from Nietzsche, this perspectivism, which most people read as a form of relativism, and he considered it mislabeling. I disagree with Roderick. I don't think it's a mislabeling. I think that people's inference from perspectivity to relativity is a bad inference. Right? I think Nietzsche would agree with me, but nonetheless, it's not a form of relativism. If it's not a form of relativism, what then is perspectivity? I've discussed that. Um, it's in the video material and on campus as well. I put some real time into discussing it um, at this position because I think in terms of epistemology, in terms of Nietzsche's epistemology, it teaches us something interesting and important for evaluating ethical theory. Right, uh, this is sort of the root of Nietzsche, uh, of Roderick's critique of both Kant and Mill that they were far too general, right, and don't take into account the notion of a full-bodied sort of no, it, it context for ethical choice making. <laughs> Nietzsche and Sartre both pick up this position. So what Nietzsche is suggesting here, um, I use the metaphor of a sculpture in order to get an entire clear comprehensive view of the sculpture, you've got to walk around it, too. You've got to take up a number of perspectives rather than coming from one single perspective. Now, this is what Roderick calls a form of imperialism in Western knowledge, that one perspective claims to be the only valid perspective with regard to the truth. Right? Philosophers do this often. Moral theorists do this more often. Right? Um, think back to your Kant. He's, he's talking about the supreme principle of morality, right? And claims that, I mean, effectively, if you're not taking up his perspective, then you're not taking up a moral perspective, right? So um, Nietzsche is attacking that kind of, as Roderick would call it, imperialism and that kind of dogmatism. And a discussion of perspectivity should sort of engage with these notions. Right. Um, it, this also relates to your discussion forum question about the, 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 the we've, we come across facts through the nets of interpretation. Robert does a good job of explaining that, um, and it's, I've put some effort into it as well. Okay, so that's your first question.
right? That's that's why each of these questions are worth 5% of your final grade. They're fairly comprehensive and involved kind of questions, right? Question number two in section 19 um, of Beyond Good and Evil. BGE is Beyond Good and Evil, by the way. It's, this is standard academic notation, right? Uh, Nietzsche claims that the act of willing, as discussed in terms of the supposedly simple concept of the free will, is, quote, something complicated, something that has unity only as a word, end quote. Nietzsche lays out a four-part treatment of the will. Your job is to discuss this treatment, examining um, all four parts in terms of Nietzsche's criticism of the free will. Right. So I asked you to do basically three things in that last sentence. Right. Um, this is why it's important to break down these questions and and get clear on what I'm asking here. I'm asking you to discuss this treatment of the will. That is, offer an overview of it. Right. I, I want to see that you understand Nietzsche's position. Right. Um, in brackets, I ask you to discuss all four parts, so break it down into its four parts and tell what Nietzsche is talking about there, um, and then engage with Nietzsche's criticism of the free will, right? And um, in terms of sections of the text that you're dealing with, um, they all have section headings. It starts in section 19 and goes to 21, right? Um, it, with the the four-part treatment is um, ear page 18 through 20, um, that sort of thing, um, it, where he points out that we've been thinking of freedom of the will all wrong, right? Um, and in fact, we shouldn't think of these wills as really free in the sense that we've been thinking of, the, of them as free. In section 21, on page 21, um, it, he tells us that we should um, overcome um, the opposite non-concept of the free will. I mean, the unfree will, which amounts to a misuse of cause and effect, right? Now, um, it, towards the bottom of that page, it continues, we alone are the ones who have invented causes, succession, reciprocity, relativity, coercion, number, law, freedom, reason, purpose. And if we project, it, it, if we mix this world of science into things as if it were in, in itself, we act once more as we have always done, that is, mythologically. The unfree will is mythology. In real life, it's only a matter of strong and weak wills. Now, in very general terms, what he's getting at here is the same thing that he was getting at in section 19, right? Um, and in that passage um, that I quoted to you, the, the, the will is actually something compli complicated that has only unity as a word. When we name things, we tend to think that those simple names that we give complicated processes, right, have some form of reality, right? What Nietzsche has done by actually breaking down this simple concept of the free will into a complicated tension between competing forces has demonstrated that the simple concept isn't simple, right? So when we say a free will, we don't actually mean a free will, we mean really a strong will because in each act of willing it's, it's, it's a feat of strength, right? It's we're always willing in a context with internal tensions. We have to force ourselves into action, right? So we're not free, but that doesn't mean we're determined, right? We're neither, neither are we unfree because we are always in a context with a certain amount of power and agency. Right. Ultimately, you've seen Nietzsche make reference to his notion of the will to power. This is what he means. Right? We're in a context subject to a structure with power that dominates over us, but we're agents within this context. Right? We have the ability to push back. So we're neither really free in the sense of being completely free from constraints, nor are we unfree because those constraints do not really limit our freedom. Right? So, it's a question of strength or weakness, right? argues Nietzsche. Right? So, 
this sort of turns on its head um, the, the, the Socratean, the Aristotelian, and on top of that, the Kantian notion of freedom is freedom from our desires and our drives and instincts, or freedom from you know, the constraints of our context, right? Because even Socrates, what is X kind of questions that are supposed to be the only thing that determines how we act, right? These are ways of abstracting from our situation, our context, and even our desires, right? So what Nietzsche is saying is that this is fundamentally impossible, right? So this calls into question a certain kind of approach to ethics that would focus on autonomy, right? Reason offering us a perspective other than our desires. Right? Anyhow, I'm giving you too much there. Um, and it, it, it switches it to a notion of agency, where agents right, that, 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 that confront problems and overcome them. Oh, no, hopefully, anyway. Right? So um, again, right, so did, what are you doing here? Um, give me an overview of his notion of the will. Right? Examine the four parts, right, and then explain how this is a criticism right, of the supposedly simple notion of the free will. Right. Now, on to Sartre. Sartre, on page 13 of your Existentialism and Human Emotions, and if you don't have this book, I've, I've, I've scanned it and it's up there, and I'm probably in violation of copyright for that, but uh, what can you do? Right. Anyhow, now on page 13 of Existentialism and Human Emotions, discussing the basic principles of existentialism, claims right, what they that is, the positions of various articulations of our existentialist philosophy have in common is that they think existence precedes essence, or, if you prefer, that subjectivity must be the starting point. What does Sir mean by this? Right. Um, this goes to the heart. This is the credo of existentialism, that existence precedes essence. And um, both in on-campus and online versions of this, I've given you extensive sort of discussions of existence preceding essence. That is, we're essentially nothing and only become something when we choose and we act, at which point that demonstrates that we're both absolutely free and absolutely responsible. We're not bound by some sort of chocolatey center essence. Right? Because if we are, Right. If there's some sort of inner self that's constrained in some ways or doesn't have capacity, it, I mean, effectively, right, it, we're not in control of our lives. Right? Sartre argues rather that rather than an objective notion of what a human being is, right, or rather than some sort of essentialist notion of what I, Grant Yoakum, or you, whoever you are, are, right, it, effectively, we are our freedom. We choose always within a context and that sort of thing. And that's what anxiety, forlornness, and despair are. But nonetheless, we're free. We choose. We act. And we invent ourselves through this process of choosing and acting. At which point, right, as a result of this, not because we're rational and autonomous or something along those lines, but rather, right, not because of that, but because this is just what we are. We're beings that invent ourselves through our actions. We are responsible, right? Because we're free, we are responsible. All right. So um, hopefully that should be, um, it, like Roderick is, is fond of saying, this is an ordinary thing to know about Sartre, right? So um, I tried to be very straightforward with that one. Then, um, related to this, question number four, um, five pages later in this book, which even if you don't have, you have because it's on Moodle. Um, Sorry, on page 18 of Existentialism and Human Emotions, in order to make clear the relatedness of freedom and responsibility, asserts, quote, in choosing myself, I choose man. First question, what does Sartre mean by this? Right. And it, this is an argument that should it reminds you of Kant, right? But it's important to present it in a way that's distinct from what Kant argued, right? Um, it, which I just, in terms of the previous question, it sort of gave away. Um, and then what does this have to do with anguish or anxiety 
discuss from page 18 to 21. Five points. Right. So effectively, what I would do if I were answering this, I would start with um, a discussion of anguish or anxiety. Right. Um, what does Sartre mean by that? Right. And then move to um, this claim in choosing myself, I choose man. Right. Um, on campus, I don't remember what I did in the video, but on campus, and I suspect I did this on the video because I've been talking about it in these terms, I used the example of those sort of cheesy 80s science fiction kind of stories where a collection of like five human beings are scooped up by aliens and um, in order to classify the human, the human race, right, on the basis of the decisions of these five people, this classification is being uh, you, you know, made by these aliens who just observe, and invariably the horrible, sort of selfish, um, aggressive, dangerous kind of impulses um, it, it manifest themselves in these human beings. But in any case, whatever these human beings are, right, whatever they do becomes part of the definition of human, right? So again, it's related to the notion that existence precedes essence. If freedom and responsibility are tied in this way, in choosing ourselves, we choose mankind. That effectively what we're doing with each and every one of our activities is definitional to the human race. Right? In, on campus, and I'm pretty sure I did this in the video, it's been a little while since I've watched my own video, um, but nonetheless, I'm pretty sure I did this in the video as well. Uh, think about the gas chambers in World War II. We had never seen that before. Human beings had never in enacted that kind of bureaucratic genocide before in the whole history of the human race. That's something new about humans. But now that's something about humans. It's, it defines us, right? So in choosing themselves, even the people that were janitors at the facilities that gassed millions of Jews, right, chose all of mankind, right? And we all now have to sort of, you know, engage with that truth about humankind as a result of the free choices and actions, right, of a few people, right? No, no, no. I'd love to get into this further, but I think I'd just confuse the issue kind of thing. And it's, if you're interested in that issue as it pertains to existential phenomenology, I mean, there, there are additional references and additional discussions I'll, I'll point you to, email me. But um, nonetheless, right, that's the tension that I'm asking you to engage with. Um, so I ask myself, um, it, do you understand what anguish is? Do you understand, uh, in choosing myself, I choose man, this particular feature of anguish that relates freedom and responsibility. So how clear is it? Have you engaged with it completely or is there some aspect of what I asked you to do that you forgot to do? Um, do you understand it? Right? Or are there misunderstandings that are evident from your written response? And um, have you done anything insightful? Right. Um, this material is great with examples, specifically this last material, because it all relates to sort of the lived experience of being human. Um, so examples are a great way to show that you've, you've got some sort of insightful understanding of this. Um, more generally, it's been an interesting semester. Um, I hope you've taken something from this course. Um, I've tried to pick theorists and tried to sort of structure discussions that might be helpful to you. Um, it's we've looked at over two thousand years of Western theory about you know how to make choices and how to be a good human being. Right? We started with with Socrates, who you know, courageous and honest might be the words that it you know it's. What I've done with each of these theorists is picked ones with some form of, I think, important insight, right? Be courageous, be honest, right? These were the principles that grounded Socratic uh, thinking, right? Then we moved on to Aristotle, right? Uh, be excellent, right? Exhibit this drive to be an excellent human being, and that's going to involve balance, right? 
And then we move on to Kant. I know it's like trying to come up with something valuable that Kant has offered, right? Be meticulous about your choice making, right? And go forward with the understanding that sometimes doing with right, what's right is going to be a bitter pill, but you should still do it. Right? That's, that's effectively the insight that, that, that Kant gave us. Right? John Stuart Mill, be attuned to suffering and what's more, not just your own, the suffering of others. Right? These are not bad principles. Right? Then in terms of Nietzsche, I mean, if we're going to give an overview of Nietzsche, what are we saying? What are we going to, 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 to call that? I mean, effectively, right, we should be critical and skeptical of the effects of power, structures, and language on our understanding and our dispositions. If we're going to be our own people, right, if we're going to assert our own identity, it's going to be done in terms of agency because it's just a fact we exist in a world with structures of power. It's just it's just a fact, right? So how do we make room for that which is personal? Because that which is personal is that which is creative and that which is fully human, right? Otherwise, we become cogs in a machine. Right? So first we have to get over the prejudices, and secondly, we need to start engaging experimentally with our lives, because if Nietzsche's right about the kind of creatures that we are, I mean, being a human being is an act of sort of aesthetic creation, right? Build a life that you can be proud of, right? Uh, the same sort of insight in Jean-Paul Sartre, but the interesting thing about Sartre is that, I mean, to a certain extent, we might never get to a right answer about what there is to do. There's no book that can do this for us. There's no app. There's no person with a position of authority. What Sartre does is frames each of these theorists in the light that they are. They're just good people trying to figure out how to be good people, what's involved, what it requires, that sort of thing. And maybe at the end of the day, if Sartre's right, it, we might realize that our freedom always finds itself in a context. And it's complicated to live up to the demands of that freedom and the responsibility that that involves. Right? So, I mean, effectively, each of these theorists have something, something to add at their best. Are there ways to critique them? Yes. Yes, there are ways to critique each and every one of these theorists. I've issued these critiques myself. Right? You should too. You shouldn't take these at face value. So if you're going to walk away from this course right, with any sort of understanding, I mean, it might be in terms of the principles that are at work be behind each of these theorists. Right? Courage, honesty, excellence, right? exhibiting a certain degree of balance in your attempt to be an excellent human being, right? Be meticulous, right? And understand that sometimes doing with right isn't going to please you. Be conscious of the suffering of others, right? Be critical of the powers that frame your life in a particular kind of way. Think beyond them, act beyond them, right? Because your life is your own, right? It's your own creation, right? And at the end of the day, live up to your freedom, live up to your responsibility, and do so with the understanding that there, there are no right answers, there are no guarantees, right? There's no system that can do this for you, right? At the end of the day, it is, it's on you. And it's natural to feel anxious, forlorn, and a bit of despair because, you know, sometimes things don't work out. That's despair. You don't know what the right thing to do is, and that's going to that's gonna make you feel forlorn. And each and every one of you, there's a lot riding on your decisions. Once you act, there's no way to take back that act, right? And each of them are, you're both free, which is nice, but you're responsible, right, in a deep sense for what you do. 
Right. So going forward, um, it, it might be those insights that are the most useful thing from this course. Otherwise, hopefully, I hope you've become better writers right, as a result. And hopefully, maybe you take more philosophy courses. Um, I'm going to be posting uh, the brochure uh, for next year's philosophy courses on the um, Moodle page. So take a look at that. Um, lots of interesting stuff. Um, I basically teach this course and Intro to Philosophy, so if you like me and want to take more courses, those are my courses. That's the extent of it. Um, I'm not teaching this summer. So, anyhow, um, have good days. Uh, one for each of you if you have any questions. Like I say, Monday from 2 till 4, um, I will be in the office at OU, um, so if you need anything, um, it, come see me, um, uh, send me emails, I try to respond to them, um, but there are a lot of you and there's one of me, and there are a lot of emails that I get, so um, I'm juggling, but I'm trying. Um, thank you for a nice semester. All right, take care.